that. We're joined by, uh, again, Matt Brown, extra points and also a part of the D1 ticker. Very, very much entrenched in college athletics and much more. Matt, there's a lot I want to get to, including last week's news and the meeting in Washington, NIL, et cetera, whatever the IRS is saying. But what are your thoughts, some of the early returns on the SEC, their 2024 schedule? A&M will host Texas. We know Texas and Oklahoma we're going to keep playing, but Texas hosts Georgia, Oklahoma, Alabama. Your thoughts? I, I think it sounds like a lot of fun. I, I'm, I'm disappointed that the SEC is not immediately shifting to a nine-game conference schedule. I, I hope that that, that happens in, in the near future, You know, whatever it takes for this, this one transitional year. But my understanding is that everybody in the league is going to get to face either Texas or Oklahoma uh, in, in the beginning. Which should make for uh, for really compelling matchups for for any kind of casual fan. You know, the, the the big frustration I think with the SEC scheduling over the last couple of years is that with only eight games and with, with a league at this size, it feels like less of a conference because you might go your entire co- you know, uh, career not playing anybody or, or certainly not visiting every single campus from a, from a football perspective. And, and and you know now getting rid of the divisions, moving things up a little bit. I'm, I'm hopeful this is a step to more high-quality, uh, consistent you know, SEC conference games in the course of the season. Matt, in that regard, you know, big matchups. That's what television wants. There's so many conversations going on right now about college football and what it looks like, what the configurations will be, what the money will be. Um, the SEC is standing to gain a lot of money with with this schedule, with these new teams. Um just how do you feel like things are, are stacking up for those who fear or encourage the, the whole super conference idea? You see the way things are shaping up. Are you somebody who buys into that's where we're headed or that's where we already are? Or are you somebody with a more optimistic wide view that everybody's still going to have an invite to the, the big party? Yeah, I, I, to be honest with you, I was, I've been pretty consistently anti uh, a, a big two or some kind of college football champions league thing until really the last six months. Um, I, I don't think a formal breakaway or designation is something that's going to happen immediately. The, the, the impetus for this kind of change is less, to me, about television revenue because we're still in a system where, yes, the SEC is going to make a lot more and the Big Ten is going to make a lot more, but you can still be very successful without making the most money if you are investing it the right way. We've seen this with Clemson. We've seen this historically with Florida State. We've seen this with schools in the Big 12 footprint. We've seen it with Texas, who's had you know, plenty of money uh, and, and, and will have plenty of money there before, but hasn't won anything meaningful in, in, in a long time. That may change over uh, a decade, decade plus. But as state laws change, as what's happening here uh, with, with potential federal involvement, not just with NIL, but potentially with athlete employment, that could be not a straw that breaks the camel's back so much as a, you know, a collection of very heavy two by fours that might, uh, those kind of changes are the things that I could see a, a, a breakaway of 40, 45, 50, 72, something else at the side. College football is something very different. Now these kind of schools are going to commit to that and everybody else is going to commit to something else. Are those two by fours lacquered? Like have they been lacked, lacquered in the, are they have nails in them too, just to make sure people <laughs> can feel them? You know, I would have to defer to uh, my friends in the Auburn community who I think know more about pressurized, you know, pine and timber uh, than, than maybe that I do. Uh, but but they're, 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 they're heavy enough to cause some significant damage. What were your thoughts when the story came out late yes, last week about the NIL, the IRS? Was that just kind of a bluster or is that a legitimate threat? Oh, my friends, this is this is not bluster at all. This is dead serious. And I'll tell you, like, this has been a personal hobby horse of mine, actually, because I have been saying this on Extra Points for a year. Um, many professors of, uh, and, and recognized national experts in nonprofit accounting law, some of my publications, some elsewhere have said this. And privately, many athletic directors and even some in the collective industry have all said the same thing. These large groups that are raising institutional amounts of money, seven, eight, you know, above figures that are registered as 501c3s who are uh, skating on extremely thin ice. And that day of reckoning uh, may not come today, even after this memo. It might not come next week. It might not come for six months because the IRS is backlogged. But it is going to come. Um, you can call giving somebody $500,000 to speak at a charitable event and sign some autographs, a lot of things. But you cannot call a charity with a straight face to the IRS. You know, that is the entity that, that's, that's going to come after you here. So 
we have collectives that I think are going to be able to make a transition to a not-for-profit LLC model relatively easily. If you're not dependent on 10 gigantic donors, um, if it, then you're moving to a more broad-based system and just not taking a cut, not a big deal. Some of these uh, these 501c3s for low majors, look, man, if you're if you're raising charity, you know, money to give to people at like Bryant or some Southland school or you know some FCS school, I don't think the IRS is going to come after you. But if you're Texas or Ohio State or Oklahoma or some of these entities that have kind of thumbed their nose at the IRS and, and flagrantly using your collectives or some of these collectives to try and recruit players. Uh, you are in big trouble. <laughs> and, and that is something like you should not talk to me. You should not tweet. You should call your attorneys uh, because this is, this is a legitimate, real concern that they should be worried about. Matt, uh, Texas just signed into to law some new NIL regulations over the weekend uh, that's going to open things yep. up. But we had Matt Rhodes, Baylor's AD on, and he's taking a different approach. He's saying that, hey, the way that I read it, this is not all on the up and up as far as NCAA rules go. And so we're going to play it a little safer, and we're not going to risk the chance that we do something, we cross the line, and then we get punished for it later. I know others blow right past the stop sign, but is he unique in that regard? Is that a play that you think, is smart or is it more worth it? Just go ahead and go for it because, you know, what is the NCAA going to do in the end? How do you see that sort of a, of a play? Yeah, I, I would say that I would not blame anybody who works at Baylor to feel like they should, you know, always err on the side of conservatism and caution True. Uh, with the, with, with the NCAA, with risk management in general. Right. And you can see this with a couple of schools that have been burned pretty badly. With the NCAA, uh, historically, they're looking at this a little bit more conservatively. Uh, I, I know of a, a couple of other schools within the Big 12 footprint, BYU obviously one of them, but, but also Cincinnati, also Iowa State, um, that are not going to try and take every tiny little advantage that they, that they think that they have. And it's not just necessarily about NCAA risk. If you decide to go, we are going to be as aggressive as possible. We are going to marry our institutional fundraising arm with our NIL collective fundraising arm, we're going to try to grab as many bags as we, as we possibly can and forget the NCAA. You might be okay on the NCAA front. Uh, I, I cannot sit here on the, on the phone, fellas, and, and promise you that the NCAA will or will not do this future thing because it's, it's a little bit of an irrational organization and we don't know what the law is going to be or the policy is going to be in a year. But I would argue there are significant like organizational risks. If you're dependent on 12 rich guys to drop bags on your program, you're not the athletic director. The 12 rich guys are the athletic director. And there's a lot of people out here who are very good at selling cars in Texas or finding oil or selling financial services. But, brother, they are lousy at hiring football coaches and they're lousy at being general managers. <laughs> We've seen programs in this state across the country that have listened to the money guys more than they have the professionals or the coaches or the athletic directors. So I don't blame anybody for wanting to be a little bit more conservative especially at a place like Baylor where you're probably not going to, you know, sign 45 five stars, even if you were cheating. So why not try to do things a little bit closer to the book? Matt, what is the, uh, your end game you think, or the end game with possibility of collegiate players not wanting, uh, just $500 or their attachment to EA sports college football? Yeah. I, so I, 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 I will be honest here. Like I've, I've, I've done some reporting on this. The organization that has proposed the boycott, the National, the, the, the National College Football Players Association, is a very small group. And it's a group where the majority of its current membership are not current college football players. There are, there are people that are, there are ex-NFL guys, people whose eligibility has expired, and they're trying to use this to raise awareness. I understand their intellectual and ideological argument. You know, they are saying this deal was, was negotiated and created without any input from any current college football player. And I can understand why a player would be upset about that. There, now, could anybody manage to get enough people to say, I'm not going to sign this game to actually you know, change that contract? I, I highly, highly doubt it. And I think anybody that talks to football players on a regular basis knows there are thousands of them that would do this for free mm -hmm. if they got a copy of the game. Because this was the only thing about NAL that they really deeply wanted. So, hey, you're telling me I got 500 bucks in mailbox money and a free copy of this game? to do the thing that I wanted more than anything else in the world to begin with, like organizing against that will be very hard, especially because guys, this isn't mad at if you're playing a college football game, everyone graduates in a year or two. It doesn't matter if Caleb Williams, not in the game because when you're firing up your dynasty 
for, you know, Sam Houston State, by, by year six, everyone's already gone. You're playing against computer players. It's not the, it's not the same NFL experience, so the individual value of a right is not the same. I imagine the next deal will be better than 500 and a copy of the game. And you could, I think, credibly argue it's a little bit under market value, but I would be blown away if there was a significant labor action here to force EA and force one team partners to change the deal. Matt, do you think there's any possibility or part of this is that so much now that the athletes, the student athletes have gotten in the last three years from the transfer portal to the NIL to really a lot of, uh, that you now get with a scholarship is not just you get to go to school for free, that a lot of athletes just want more. Not that they're greedy, but they now think their value is almost more than it should be. Well, it, it, it's, a, it's a tough question, right? And I, among the, among the kind of athletes that I talk to on a regular basis, you, you talk to people who do Olympic sports, you know, we have thousands and thousands of athletes and it's, I think it's harder to find somebody who runs track or swims and says, I'm exploited. Um, you know, I, and it's, it's not hard, right? Cause you're, you're, you're not typically generating revenue, excess of tuition. You're going to find some athletes that are going to say, no, I'm pretty good. I, you know, I got all the muscle milk I could drink. I got some spending money in my pocket. I'm going to, I'm going to walk away from, from college with a, you know, with 50 grand and, and move on. And some people will be happy with that. And there are others again that I think it's still credibly point, but look at the, all of the money in this ecosystem. Um, and ultimately, the, what, what, what will be the you know, drive the final result in all of this world? I don't think is athlete organization. It, it's really the law. And if the law, if federal judges look at this and say it doesn't really matter if most of you are happy with this situation or, or if, if many of you think that your marketability is much higher than it actually is because you're looking at made up on three numbers or listening to some agent who didn't pass the bar and doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, like that's, that that's part of life. The question is not whether you're, you have it pretty good. The question is whether you're compliant with the law. And then, and that's what the judge is going to do here to make these decisions about employment. I, I, you, I, I, I do think it's important for fans to understand. We could be heading down to a world where, where college athletes become employees or become something more structured than they are now where many athletes get a worse deal than they have now. And I, I, I leave it to other people to say if, if that's more just, if the top 15%, um, you know, get what's really, what, what they really deserve and things get worse for everybody else. And if, if that's the most fair or just outcome, like I, I could, I could go either way. That's a real possibility of where this all ends up. Last thing for you, please explain to me. I have had a blast watching your Twitter feed about <laughs> the athletic director simulator 3000. Is this a chance for anyone to try to be an athletic director of a college campus? That, that is what we're trying to put together. Wow. Like, and, and fellas, like I'm not a software developer by trade. I'm a writer. We, we brought in some contractors. I, I, I learned some coding here myself, but it's in the beta version right now. And what it is, it's the game is going to look a little bit like the Oregon trail. You know, we're talking eight bit audio, black, yeah. black and green screen, but it, you, you're going to start as the AD of a place like an Abilene Christian, you know, like a, like, you know, like a, like an art UTRGV, you know, some kind of low major FCS school. And you're, you're going to be given a variety of very realistic situations that an athletic director might face. Everything from coach hiring to licensing deals to apparel contracts to a parent is mad at your baseball coach to the bus broke down outside of Tulsa to all of these kind of things. And you have to manage your budget and your winning percentage and your local political support. And there's not a right answer um, because in real life you can make right decisions and things blow up in your face because that's how college sports works. Uh, and we built it primarily to be something that helps students who are studying sports management or might want to work in college athletics. But once we teased that, we realized a bunch of fans were interested and even a couple of ADs. So if you subscribe to Extra Points, which you can find at extrapointsmb.com, you can play this game now. Everybody else, once I finish the typos or fixing the typos and make a couple more quality of life improvements, we hope to have this out for the general public at the end of July. Man, that's awesome. I, I mean, that is absolutely awesome. We hope it works out. When you get it done, we will absolutely get you on the show to talk about it, help sell it. I love it. And get it out there as well. Matt, as always, great stuff. We appreciate your time. Of course. Hey, thanks, fellas. I you, appreciate you having me on. Have a great rest of your week. You too. Matt Brown, publisher of Extra Points. That's kind of like